So we just arrived at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, which we're, we've been told is so good, which we know is code for so horrible. Horrible. <laughs> horrible. So this is now day three of so horrible, but so impactful, so important. Part of me is super excited to go through those doors. They're, they're right in there. Let's see. See? Go right in there. And part of me is dreading that I have to do this. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, we just talked about how we're just going to sit here and like soak in peace for a minute and then... Then horrible. Then horrible. Yeah. We are psychotherapists, not filmmakers, but we're about to take you on a life-changing adventure. This Black History Month, join me, Elliot Connie, and my best friend, Dr. Adam Froer, as we explore some of the most defining moments in our country's history through the lens of a solution-focused expert. You know, I, I liked watching movies growing up as a kid, I still do, and going to see the movie uh, Ghost of Mississippi, which is the story of Medgar Evers' role in the civil rights movement. In the first place we went when we arrived in Jackson, I remember it was like getting dark, dark like dusk, and we went to go visit his home, and uh, he was shot and killed in his driveway, and there's still kind of like a blood stain. 50 years later in his driveway. But it, it's, uh, and I think it was a museum, but it closed because of COVID and also the time of day it was. And it's just in a neighborhood. I mean, it's just like, this is how he lived in, it was in the neighborhood. And I walked around the backyard and there was a clothesline. And I just remember, like, this is where he hung his family's laundry. You know, this is where his wife hung her family's laundry. And now, However, I mean, 60 years later, people are driving to this house to kind of mark that. It humanized it to me a bit to just see his backyard looking like a regular old backyard with a place you hang your laundry. Medgar Evers, he was fully aware that his behavior, that the things that he was trying to advocate for, that it could cause him trouble. He was supposed to be escorted by a police officer, he was supposed to be escorted by an FBI agent, and on the day that he that he was shot, neither of those people were with him, right? And so he he was very aware of the danger that could come to him as a result of his actions. One of the things that we're learning along this journey is like the different way resources have been spread about throughout history and created like generational struggles with wealth and poverty. And I just had a realization that I've never had before, but like these slaves were working really, really hard. Um, I hate to use the word work, cause it's not work, but they were like forced to do really, really hard things to contribute to the wealth of another person. And then that person gave that wealth to the next generation and it just compiles and here we are in 2021 as we drive around Mississippi you can clearly see the difference between the affluent areas and the non-affluent areas and I, I've always realized like you took the wealth from the enslaved people and you took the land from the indigenous people but you also took their ability to work to create their own wealth that they could give to subsequent generations and now here we are like living in the time of the subsequent generations and that struggle is still apparent. Sometimes with us as solution-focused clinicians we need to realize we we aren't in the business of changing people's realities but we are in the business of helping them to see themselves as the person who is capable of fulfill, fulfilling that journey. Um, and I think that same lesson applies to Hezekiah Watkins, right? He's the kid who at 13 years old goes to prison and is on death row. And from that moment goes on to be imprisoned over a hundred times. Um, and 
at any point he could have said, this is too much, this is too hard, I don't want to do this, right? But he didn't. Um, he knew that the journey that he was on was important enough that he needed to continue on that journey. And I think, again, we as solution-focused practitioners, we meet people sometimes at the beginning of a difficult journey, or we meet them at the, in the middle of a difficult journey. Um, and our job isn't to change the journey. Our job is to help them to become the person who is capable of fulfilling that journey. And Hezekiah Watkins said he actually found it, in the end, fun. And he found it enjoyable, and he made really important connections with people. And I think sometimes we get so narrow-visioned that we think this horrible journey is only going to bring harm. And we forget that Hezekiah, the Hezekiah Watkins can find joy in that journey and can find connections in that journey. So I'm someone right now who's struggling with like purpose in my, in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm aware I'm talking to somebody who at the age of 13 was just like riding a bike and literally a shove happened and put you on a, on a different path, whatever. I mean, maybe it would have been a doctor, maybe it would have been a drug dealer, who knows? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm from Chicago. I know what you're saying when it's like, I could play baseball. This coach noticed me when I was you know, 11, 12 or whatever. And a lot of those kids that I was friends with, their lives didn't. And now I got degrees and work with this guy and travel the world. We've been over 30 countries doing what we do. Um, how important do you think it is? And like, this is super personal. Mm -hmm. How important do you think it is to like follow your path even when you didn't choose that? You know, like it happened and you walked it. How important do you think that is? It was important because it was something. Not only did you walk your path, you got to enjoy what you were doing in order to walk that path. And I enjoyed being a freedom rider. I enjoy helping okay. others. I'm gonna can I pause you for a second? Because mm -hmm. she told me that you've been arrested ninety-nine times or something like that. One oh nine. One oh nine. They, they say one oh nine. <laughs> it's been a lot of times. So, a lot of times. So you just told us about arrest number one, mm -hmm. right, there, yeah. right here. This is mugshot one. There, mm -hmm. there are one hundred and eight happening. Mm -hmm. And then you just said, "I enjoyed being a freedom fighter." I did. Can you tell me how you found enjoyment in something that got you arrested okay, one hundred nine times? And that's a good question, sir. Because I would love to tell you. Mm -hmm. I need uh, to. I like. They need to hear it. I need okay. to hear it. I began to read, and the only thing I had that was available was Jet and Ebony. <laughs> was two magazines, two magazines. Black they magazine. don't know nothing about it, but I got We do, we know. It was black owned magazine. And they were spreading stories about, um, about blacks, the, un the, the treatment that we were receiving here in Mississippi. They had a story of uh, Jet was a weekly publication, Ebony was a monthly publication, and every publication that was issued had something in it on Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that's when I began to read and try to understand what I was reading. And when I got out of Washington prison, uh, my mother beat the hell out of me. <laughs> okay? And so bad until I didn't want nothing to do. He said, the black didn't feed him out or it. He was on. <laughs> because I was hit so bad that summer I couldn't even leave out the house because what was all the way my body. A young man by the name of James Douglas was a uh, field secretary a snake and cool here in Jackson and had heard about me being arrested. So he came to visit me at my mother's house when my mother had gone to work. And make the story short, he eventually uh, convinced my mother to let me come over more or less. And we did a grocery store, a and P, you know, together, that had no blacks working there, no blacks doing that. And James and I went inside the store and we asked the manager, 
why you don't have any black employees because your business is not 50 50. And the manager stated, because they can't count. And based on that, I'm not going to hire black. So James and I decided to do a protest. It was five of us. That Saturday went out with signs saying, I'm not sure what the signs read, but we was arrested. And we was uh, released that Monday. Went back to the drawing board, and it was obvious what needed to be done, and that was get additional individuals. And that's what we did. So the following Saturday, we went down to the store, and five went out walking around with signs. Uh, the police came and arrested those five. And before they got out of the lot, we had five more out there. And we did that for about an hour or so. And by this time, the parking lot was filled with onlookers. And um, they didn't do the business that day. And the following week, the manager came looking for us and said, if you send me three, I will hide them on the spot. Send them three. And they was high. And that's when I realized the power we had. Did you enjoy it? I did I. Were you Man, I, I really did. Did the enjoyment, enjoyment outweigh the arrest? Oh, yes, sir. And, and uh wasn't beating on, on, on that arrest, but all the other arrests. Where, uh, where as I was beaten, um, he was able to override it, even being shot at, uh, because I knew that I was going to come back and do something positive uh, for my race. And then, plus, here I am running from the police officers. They are shooting at me, but I got a white guy beside me who's running along with me. Because if they shoot me, surely they're going to shoot him. Well, he's been shot a few times, times metaphorically because so, of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's helping me more so than I'm helping him. So we bonded. So, you know, you, it's, it's just hard. <laughs> it's just hard. We, we just, I just did a prayer uh, for a church. That's why I was like coming in here. Oh, you weren't late. We didn't have an appointment. You were being generous. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so we get to Selma, and um, Adam's wife had scheduled a tour around Selma. And the tour guide happened to know the woman that owned the home that was Martin Luther King's headquarters in Selma. And I started feeling like, almost like history was helping us tell this story. Because we got access to that house and there's artifacts everywhere. I mean, the house is also, remember, all of the MLK stuff was kind of time capsuled and that was also true in Selma. But by this time, it really felt like history was wanting us to tell this story. This guy will talk you to death. Ellie, you and him need to meet. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on today? You, you, you two need to meet. Adam, can you take a picture of that water tower? Because on the pictures, I'm filming. Oh, okay. We're going to come back, so. Okay. Tabernacle Church right there. The meetings were held there, too. SNCC meetings? Yeah. Uh, that's Good Samaritan Hospital. That's where they took Jimmy Lee Jackson. It is, uh, I think, 12 black doctors are supposed to be uh, restored. It. Creep up and get in the right lane. All right, when Jimmy Lee Jackson, his grandfather, his mother ran, guys, this is what the way they ran. Keep going. They came up and they ran through this alley. All of this, guys, is in the movie. This is the alley. They ran down to that stop sign and they quickly turned left. The only reason I didn't take you there is because it's roped off. Turn to the right, I'm finna take you on the trail that they ran. Again, all of this is in the movie. Selma is a place where, like you, you said, history was on our side or history wanted us to tell that story. And I think. For me, if I were to draw, like, again, as kind of a solution-focused perspective from it, I would say oftentimes in solution-focused therapy, we talk about, like, if a miracle happened. And I feel like 
like Selma was a place of miracles for us. The, the thing that really stands out to me is we got to go into where Martin Luther King spent his time and there there's a bucket and he said tomorrow we're gonna go on a sacred walk we're gonna be walking on sacred ground and he said I want to wash your feet and we got to sit in the chair that they sat in and we got to see and touch the bucket that he used to wash their feet. We got to pick up the telephone that he used to, to talk to the President of the United States as they were trying to negotiate um, how to... The how Civil to, Rights Act. Yeah, to, how to, to negotiate the Civil Rights Act. And, and I think that for me, it was, it was a place of miracles. It was a place of miracles for them. That's where so much of history kind of took a, took a turn. Um, it, was a, it was a place of miracles for us. Um, just getting to experience firsthand that history. My husband and I were on the same board as the, I gotta go to the other side. This is, um, this is where he sat. So the story goes supposedly that Jean would come and she'd be stirring something because she was always cooking. She'd go, I think you should do da da da. And supposedly Jean, I saw Martin Luther King told Sully, could you keep Gina? And she's like, I heard what you told Sully, but I still think. <laughs> you know, she was, wasn't she the fourth grade teacher that taught everybody? Did she teach taught you? Taught my brother. Really? My youngest brother, Greg. Yeah. So yeah. she really want to see Barack Obama to sit at this table. That would be amazing. It would be. And no, we would like to see Barack Obama sit at the table because Martin Luther King and Ralph Bunch, two African American, only two at that point African American Nobel Peace Prize winners, sat at this table. Okay, y'all can both sit in that chair. That's it. That's it. These are the stories that no one knows. These are just regular people, and I, and I think, like lawyers do this all the time, right? So like, you you you're defending a murderer, and they say like, get a haircut. Um, you know, wear a suit and tie to court. And they do that to humanize. Yep. Um, and I think part of this is like humanizing the civil rights struggle instead of like, it's a textbook or these are icons. Cause these are just regular people living in a regular neighborhood, living regular life. But in a snapshot in time, they did an extraordinary thing. And in a weird way, the world benefited from their extraordinary thing more than they did. Mm. Well, and I think, too, I think really what that means is that anybody could be extraordinary, right? Not just it's could, like should. should. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's just that sometimes the world that doesn't capture it. Right, right, right. So. Right. Like the, that snapshot in time was captured in film and it was captured in, in, in court document. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was so extraordinary and so bad that it had legs and lived on. Um, but it was almost like a gift they gave us mm -hmm. that we get to benefit from more than they did. Yeah. Because this community is... Could be exactly the way it was, minus new cars. I don't want to say anything, but this community could use some new paint. <laughs> could use some new pavement on the road. There's decrepit buildings all over town. But right here is where they said... Okay, world, here. Like, here's a gift towards equality, towards justice, towards humanism. Like, okay, world, here. We have nothing to give you but integrity. Because mm. they can use some paint around here. <laughs> yeah. That was insane. That was nuts. That, Adam, we were supposed to leave Tulsa, uh, I mean, not Tulsa, uh, Selma, Selma, hours ago. But I can't believe, like, the personal access we just had to MLK's Selma world. Yeah, it was it was nuts. I mean, like, I think one of the highlights for me is obviously, like, sitting in the chairs where he sat, learning about, like, the bucket where he washed people's feet. Um, just the symbolism of, of that is amazing. I mean, we were just walking through the, like sit using the phone that he talked to President LBJ with and like they were negotiating the the Voters Rights Act. Yeah. yeah um <laughs> I never imagined that, oh. that could happen. No. Oh. 
no. <laughs> I never, ever, ever, ever imagined it. It's awesome. It is incredible.